It turns out that Darlene uh, Lim's own hero as she was growing up as a child was Jacques Cousteau. Darlene, do I have that right? Yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, today she continues with her own fascination with the unknown, except this time the object of her affections is Mars. I had to do a little research uh, for those of you who aren't uh, perfectly trained in the sciences, like me. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. Uh, it's half the size of the Earth. It's got an atmosphere made up mainly of carbon dioxide. Its surface temperature is minus 63 degrees centigrade. It's plagued by dust and sandstorms. And that's why apparently Darlene lives in Nunavut. Well, I visited it, yes. Right, Devon Island, where there's a 23 million year old crater, about 21 kilometers across, and uh, whose harsh climate and harsh geology is a good approximation for Mars, right? Yep. All right, Darlene. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am very, very excited to be here today. Yes, Jean-Michel, uh, Jean your dad was totally my hero. I was a latchkey kid, so I actually watched a lot of TV, and I have to say that what I saw you know, through the films of Jacques Cousteau really inspired me when it came to exploration. And then I watched Canadians become astronauts, and that to me was just incredibly mind-boggling. So if we can perhaps bring up the first slide immediately. That'd be great. Oh. <laughs> there we go. I know full well that I'm actually here to speak to you today about Mars, Can we but just light up the speaker? apparently I need to be illuminated. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So uh, I know that I'm here to speak to you about Mars, but actually I wanted to put up this photograph first because I this is a photo of the Earth in the foreground and the Moon in the background, and it's not an AV problem. It actually is sort of a fuzzy, out-of-focus image. Um, but I thought that it would be sort of the perfect image to start the talk off with. I actually am here, to, of course, to talk to you about Mars. The exploration of Mars, both in the past, in the present, and in the future tense, and um, this image here is a very special one, and it was taken by the Mars Global Surveyor. The Mars Global Surveyor uh, is an orbiter. It's a satellite going around the planet Mars, and it's snapping incredible photographs of that planet. But recently, on May the 8th, it actually snapped this photograph, which is um, a photo, of course, as I said, of the Earth. And the reason why this is such an interesting photograph is because it's the first photo of our planet from a different planet, from Mars. And so, you know, really when I look at this, I think it's such a spectacular photograph because it really captures, I think, the vulnerability, the isolation, and also some of the fragility of our home planet. But the other thing it does is that it really gives us a glimpse into the future. So if you can imagine, perhaps um, in 2019 or 2025, we have the first human explorers on Mars, and perhaps a couple of them are feeling a little wistful for home. They've been trapped in their capsule now for 500 days on the surface of Mars, and maybe Joe Astronaut has picked his teeth the wrong way one too many times, and they're a little irritated. So they go outside, and they point their camera and their telescope home, and this is an image which they would capture, or at least one not too much unlike this one. Now sort of scroll forward a couple hundred centuries, maybe 250 years from now or so, and we have colonists on Mars, and they have children. And these children, in fact, have never set foot on the planet Earth before. They've grown up on Mars. And, uh, but maybe they're a little curious as to where great, great, great grandma came from. So they go to their astronomy class, they set up the telescope and the camera, and once again, they capture an image not too much unlike this one here. This is a view of the future. And this future will include humans on the surface of Mars. And, so, and as I said, I'm going to talk to you about the exploration of that planet, why it is we should send humans there, and, uh, and also talk to you a little bit about why I personally think it's important that we go to Mars. But before we get to all that, let's see if I can toggle forward here. I just thought that, so that we're sort of starting on the same page, I'd give you a quick little tour, some facts and figures 
about Mars. As Moses said, Mars is half the size of the Earth. It's very cold, about minus 53 degrees Celsius. Um, it has one third the gravity that we have, and the atmosphere is very thin. It's made out of carbon dioxide, so it's not immediately hospitable to humans. We will have to go there, we will have to wear, and when we do go there, we will wear protective um, spacesuits. So we'll probably have the Mars astronauts train in uh, the newt suits, for example. Uh, maybe we should even have people that talk about Mars go and have some fun in them, too. I'm shameless. Um, <laughs> anyways. But the thing about Mars, though, that's very interesting is that even though it is half the size of the Earth, it in fact has the same amount of land area that the Earth does. So if you just forget about the oceans for a second, sorry, and um, just focus on the land, this is really, I guess, your sort of, Mars can be your Canada or your Tibet or your New Zealand of the solar system, because Olympus Mons is actually the largest volcano in our solar system. It's three times the height of Mount Everest. It's about 600 kilometers in diameter. If you were to pick up this sort of pimple on the surface of, of Mars and stick it in the US, it would fill up the entire state of Arizona. We also have this giant gash down the middle of Mars. Um, and this is Valles Marineris. This is uh, the largest and deepest canyon in our solar system, 4,000 kilometers long. And you know the Grand Canyon is about 440 kilometers long, just to put it in perspective. It's also seven to eight kilometers in depth and 200 kilometers wide. So, you know, I see in the future as this, as a, uh, let's see if we can go forward here. Oh, next slide, please. If all else fails, there we go. Um, in the future, we will have people going and exploring these magnificent mountains and valleys. And this is a, a painting by Pat Rawlings. And we're not ready yet. We won't be ready for a while to be able to take these kind of risks um, to send people out immediately to go up Olympus Mons or down the valleys of uh, Valles Marineris. But eventually, we will. But I just want to show you this next photograph. Maybe I'll just get you to forward for me. Thank you. Um, People are already thinking about how exciting it will be when we get the first human explorers going up Olympus Mons, for example. I got hooked up with a, um, a British and French production team who were interested in putting together a documentary about the first human ascent of Olympus Mons. So they put us in these um, great costume uh, spacesuits here, and they uh, said, you know, you'll have a good time, and they hooked us up to these ropes and got us to rappel up and down these cliffs, and uh, these cliffs were in Reunion Island, which is a volcanic island in the Indian Ocean. So there were five of us doing this, and in between takes, they just make you sit there, and uh, we kind of hang, hang back in our, in our harnesses, and we talk to each other, and we were just having a ridiculously good time. And you actually have to take my word that it is me. I know you can't tell that. I could have put anyone there. Um, but uh, we, we'd sit there and talk to each other about how much fun we were having, but the other thing we, we started to get excited about is, uh, is the idea of someday, in my generation, we will have our own Sir Edmund Hillary's, we will have our own Tenzing Norgays who will go up Olympus Mons and who will capture the imaginations of everyone around the world, and they will inspire, and this will happen. So I just want to talk to you a bit about some of the science, the, the, the real reasons, the objectives that are driving the missions to go to Mars, the ones that we had in the past, presently in, and also when we send humans to Mars. This is a, a map that was drawn by uh, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli. And if I think about sort of our, our love affair with the possibility of life on Mars, I think it all sort of finds its origins with this man's work. And many of you may be familiar with this, with this map and with this man. Because during the late 1800s, he did a lot of telescopic observation of Mars, and he wrote about it extensively. And he put together this map, which is filled with patterned lines that he observed on the surface of Mars. And he called these canali. And properly translated, canali means channels. But a lot of people decided to mistranslate, both intentionally and unintentionally, the word canali into canals. And so, of course, this implied that these pattern lines weren't formed by some sort of natural force. Instead, they were formed by some you know, technologically savvy civilization that was already well established on the surface of Mars. And so speculation started to abound about the possibility of Martians and life on Mars. And because of that, we have copious amounts of literature. We have art. We even have movies today that come out about Martians because even though you know, we know full well that there are no visible sort of dome 
head Tim Burton-esque structures or things running around on the surface of Mars. But it really captured our imagination. And it, and it also bubbled over into the science community. And it's still there with us today. We still want to know about life on Mars. And um, let me just put up this. Oh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we have evolved with our technology. We no longer just to have to observe Mars through a telescope. We can actually go there. So there are missions like the Mariner mission and the and Mariner missions, I should say, in the top uh, left-hand corner there, and also the Viking missions. And the first three Mariner missions that fl that went to Mars actually did flybys. So they didn't actually touch down or insert an orbit or anything. And unfortunately, when they flew by, they sort of they missed the good stuff. They missed Olympus Mons, they missed Valles Marineris, and all they sent back um, in terms of images were photographs of this very cratered, pockmarked, dry, moon-like planet. So a lot of people were disappointed. They were broken hearts. Where were these canals? Well, we didn't give up. We kept going to Mars. And so we have the Viking missions. And these are still lauded today as two of the most successful missions to Mars ever. And they sent back a myriad of photographs that revealed, in fact, that Mars were not, was not so boring. In fact, Mars has, and it was demonstrated through these images, an incredibly diverse, dynamic, um, exciting geological history. And it also gave us an indication that, in fact, liquid water may have been present on the surface of Mars in its distant past. And because of that, we've become interested in its climate in its climate history and also in the possibilities of finding past life on Mars. Next slide, please. Um, we also have the Mars Global Surveyor, which is taking many, many pictures, which has taken many pictures, including the one I first started uh, this talk off with. And um, this is going around Mars, as I said, and mapping it out visually for us and doing many other things. Next slide, please. And uh, the other thing we have had are landers. This one up here in the top um, is a Viking lander. And we've also had the other lander, the part of the Pathfinder mission that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, and it's, it also had the Sojourner rover. And I think the thing about these lander missions is that everybody gets really excited about them, more so than these orbiters. And I believe it's because we're creatures that love tactile, sort of visceral experiences. So when we see something like this, it's not very hard for us to move out of our bodies, in a sense, and put ourselves in the place of that little rover and imagine touching that rock. So these are wonderful um, missions that allow us to, I guess, indirectly go to Mars ourselves. Let's see if I can toggle on my own. Yep. This is um, the first color image of the surface of Mars that was sent by uh, the Viking missions. Other images, there's so many of them, and so many websites dedicated to photographs of Mars. But I'm just going to show you four of my favorites. The one on the left is, in fact, an, a new image um, by, taken by the Mars Global Surveyor of Olympus Mons. And it shows the caldera off beautifully. What's on the right-hand side there is uh, an angled photograph of gullies on Mars. And um, when I saw this, and of course, many other people have said this too, is that these look a lot like some of the gullies that we see in places such as the, as the Canadian High Arctic. And uh, these gullies may have formed, in fact, in association with water. But we don't know this yet for sure. Another thing is if we can just dim the lights ever so slightly. You can see on the uh, left-hand side here, this is called, there we go, this is called Happy Face Crater. And you can make out the happy face there. And when I saw this, I just thought, that is the next Niagara Falls. You can just imagine the vendors kind of setting up around there with their happy face t-shirts and their really obnoxious happy face bumper stickers. Um, <laughs> anyways, the one beside it is uh, these ripple effects on the surface of Mars. And these are, in fact, huge um, sand dunes on Mars. Maybe I'll get you to move forward. Thank you. Um, so the search for life on Mars. We are now able to be much more strategic about where we go to look for life on Mars. We're following the water trail. And we follow the water trail because here on Earth, we know that if we find water, we usually find life. We may even just find a tiny, tiny bit of water um, in places such as um, the Antarctic dry valleys, for example, where it's extremely dry, or even in the Canadian high Arctic, we manage to find life having adapted to just living on a little bit of water and, and flourishing. And of course, like I said, we're not looking for the Tim Burton-esque life anymore. We're looking for tiny life, bacterial life, because 
Now, if we go to areas where you have water that's very hot, very cold, maybe as acidic as battery acid, under very, very high pressures, we still manage to find life, and it's doing very, very well. And this has opened our minds and the possibilities to the fact that if Mars had water in its distant past, liquid water, in the form of perhaps ice-covered lakes, or ephemeral ponds, or maybe rivers or oceans, well, it may have had water, or pardon me, it may have had life take hold as well. And it may, in fact, still be there, because there is still water on the surface of Mars. Next slide, please. And uh, the thing about the water on Mars is that it is actually tied up as a solid form. So it's at the poles. The North Pole is predominantly water ice. And we have this mission right now, which is the Mars Odyssey mission. And it's um, going around Mars and actually mapping out the en elemental composition of the, of, the, uh, of the planet. And it has produced this map here. And what you're seeing is all the areas in blue are areas with um, where hydrogen has been detected. And that implies, or it indicates, that there's a lot of water ice tied up in these high latitude regions in the soil, and about the top meter of the Martian soil and the Martian regolith. And it, there's so much water ice there that, in fact, if you were to scoop a bucket of that soil up and just set it aside and let it melt out, 50% of that bucket would end up being filled with water. And so this has implications not only for the search for life, past life and present life, but it also has implications for the future. When we send humans to Mars, this could be our gold mine. This could be our resource that we end up using as drinking water or as water resource, full stop, um, in order to sustain human civilization on this planet. So it's an incredible find. So this brings me to humans on Mars. Uh, why do we want to have humans go to Mars? It is risky, without a doubt. But we want to send them there. I think there's a myriad of reasons. And we can get into this during the, the conversation break. But some things that come quickly to mind is, number one, we are the uber explorers. We are flexible physically, mentally, emotionally. The other thing is we are able to communicate and inspire each other. We can tell about joy, about fear, pain. And we're able to do that for each other in the way that no robotic mission could ever do. And in order to keep perpetuating inspiration and the need to explore, I think we need to have human explorers tell each other these stories. We are also going to need people of all walks of life input into this endeavor, which is why, for me, it's very, very exciting to be here today. And this is because when we do get to Mars, the idea is that we will need people to deal with, for example, human rights issues, legal wranglings when it comes to resource and land allocation. We'll need journalists and writers in order to document history in the making. We'll need artists. Artists are great at being able to look at the world and synthesize it and then take those experiences and communicate them in order to affect, catalyze, and, and really question as well social change. And that is going to be something that will happen as we send humans to Mars. Now, of course, we're not able to go to Mars right now. But there is a place up in our Canadian high Arctic, which is very Mars-like. So hooray for Canada. Uh, we, are some of, <laughs> we are one of the coldest and driest place, places on Earth. So it's another little national bragging right for us. Um, anyways, up on Devon Island, which is in Nunavut, uh, in, in our Canadian high Arctic, we have an impact crater, which is Houghton Impact Crater. And um, we are able to actually go up there and do analog studies. And actually, it's hilarious. I was trying to figure out a quick and succinct way of saying what we actually do up there, and I read my bio that somebody else put together, and it says an ongoing multidisciplinary international effort to conduct Mars analog studies at Houghton Crater. That's perfect. Um, <laughs> I just thought that was the best way to, to say what's going on there. But I wanted to show this to you quickly because some of you may be interested in getting involved in trying to get us to Mars um, through activities here on Earth. So one last thing I wanted to point out is that Colonies on Mars. Now, the idea is not to get humans to Mars and then come home. You know, we don't want to go there, plant a flag, sort of pat ourselves on the back for our technological marvels and our scientific discoveries, and then come home. No, in fact, the goal is to go to Mars and then stay there. And we will have the first few missions go and explore, of course, eventually set up scientific outposts, and then eventually have people actually colonize the planet. Why would we want to leave Earth? 
Well, I'll tell you what, there are some, there's many, many reasons, and we can talk about that. I've told you some of the scientific reasons why you want to go to Mars to look for life, to answer that question, are we alone in our solar system? And then, of course, are we alone in our galaxy and beyond? Mars is sort of our introductory course to our solar system. It's a springboard to the beyond. And, of course, each time we get ourselves to a situation where we have to advance our technologies, well, we do benefit from that as well. Being able to grow crops on Mars will benefit us. Being able to recycle will benefit us all in general. And the other thing is, each time we sophisticate our technologies, we are forced to sophisticate our social standards. Now, the third reason why we want to get humans to Mars, it pertains to um, a very practical reason. We are in what is called the habitable zone. We're in prime real estate in our solar system. Um, we are in a zone that is able to support life as we know it. But eventually, as the sun gets brighter and larger, as we all do as we get older, it will push us out of the habitable zone. And eventually, we won't be able to live comfortably on this planet. So we have two choices. We can roll over and play dead, or we can decide to embrace that challenge and try and get ourselves to Mars, and then, of course, not linger there for too long, and then beyond. So Mars, once again, it is a springboard. And I just want to leave you, I got the blinky red thing going, but I'll tell you what, I just want to show you this last little goofy picture here. This is me on my birthday this year in April. I happened to be in London, England, and uh, I uh, got to visit Mo Dr. Monica Grady, who's the curator of meteorites at the British National Mis uh, Natural History Museum, and she gave me what is perhaps the most memorable gift ever, and this was to hold a piece of Mars. That is a Mars meteorite in my hand, and I was giddy. I was going crazy. And it excited me, because that is the closest I've ever been to Mars to date. And, um, but I looked at it, and I thought, we will go to Mars. And when we do go to Mars, I know that my heart will be completely a pitter-patter, and I suspect that all of yours will be too. This is our responsibility to explore as much as it is to cure disease, to stop hunger and poverty. It is our responsibility to explore, and we in the first world are very fortunate because we have the resources to do these remarkable things. So let's embrace it because I, I know we'll all benefit from it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.